they were um, battling against some of the wrong ideas that were going on in the church. And this is a common um, format or a common theme throughout the history of the church. Um, somebody comes along who tries to explain something that maybe needs explaining or really doesn't really try to anyway. And then the church has to, has to sort it out and deal with whether that's true or not. And that's really what's going on with Arius. Um, and so you have this kind of a thing happening often where you have a heretic will come along and then the church has to deal with that heretic and come to terms with it. Now, heretic, by the way, means what? Someone within the church who brings up a wrong teaching. Okay, all right. This literally comes from the <coughs> word hieron, which means choice. A choice. So a heresy is like a choice for another teaching, a different kind of teaching. That's what heresy means, a different teaching, a wrong teaching. Now, technically in the church, heresy has come to mean uh, a wrong teaching, a misleading teaching that is leading people away from the truth. We typically will distinguish between heresy and then what's the right teaching usually called? Lutheranism. No. <laughs> we all talk about that. We call that orthodoxy. So when you hear orthodoxy, it's a good thing. Orthodoxy literally means, well, you take it apart. This is so much fun to hear etymologies, right? Okay, orthodoxy. Ortho means what? What's an orthodontist do? He straightens teeth. Okay, so dant is the, dante is the word for teeth, and ortho means straight. All right, so ortho literally means straight. And doxy is the Greek word for praise. So orthodoxy is straight praise or right teaching. So orthodoxy means straight, correct, right teaching. So when somebody says, hey, that's orthodox, that's a good thing. Okay, That's a compliment. Orthodox means right teaching. On the money, it's good. So good, orthodox, Lutheranism means right on the money, straight teaching, correct. Heresy is the opposite of orthodoxy. If orthodoxy is right teaching, heresy is error, wrong teaching. There's a third category. Anybody know what that one is? Another third category is heterodoxy. All right? And heterodoxy would mean what? What's heteros mean? No, you're on the right track. You're thinking heterosexual, and you figure it must be not mean opposite. Hetero means other, is what it literally means. So heterodoxy means other teaching. So we will, we will make the distinction between these three kind of options you've got. You've got heresy, you've got orthodoxy, and you've got heterodoxy. Heresy is flat out and out false teaching. Orthodoxy is the right teaching. Heterodoxy is another teaching which probably doesn't quite rise to the level of being heresy, but it's not on track either. All right, Heterodoxy is sort of a, um, a nice category for bad teaching when you don't want to label them a heretic, but they're not quite on track. That's what it amounts to. So um, like an example of a heterodox teaching, we would probably say that Baptists have a heterodox teaching on the doctrine of baptism just to be kind of nice, okay, heterodox teaching. Or probably even more appropriately, that would be, well, see, it doesn't quite rise to heresy because it's not really threatening the faith like a heresy will. Heresy is going to threaten the faith. It's going to undermine faith in Christ alone. That's, that's, you know, that rises to the level of heresy. But like another a great example would be um, the um, Calvinists or the Reformed teaching of uh, the Lord's Supper that it's not really the body and blood of Christ, but it's a symbol of Christ's body and blood. Well, that's not the right teaching. Is this going to condemn somebody to hell? No, it's a, it's a heterodox teaching. Okay, so that would be heterodoxy. So we do make these distinctions. There's heterodoxy, orthodoxy, and heresy. Now, most heretics don't wake up in the morning and say, today is a day I think it's time for a new heresy. They don't do that. Heretics don't make it the goal to be heretics. Usually, I suppose it's possible somebody could have that goal and be so nasty they just want to teach heresy. But usually what's going on is heretics end up that way because the church all decides, no, he's wrong. But heretics don't wake up wanting to be heretics. What they usually are trying to do is trying to sort out a problem or answer something in a, in a good way. That's what they're trying to do. So 
But let's go back and consider arch heretic Arius, one of the first of the great heretics. And there have been many, many great heretics. And so Arius comes along. What is Arius trying to do? And this is worth doing just because it's uh, instructed to see how this kind of plays out. What is Arius trying to do? He is trying to solve a problem. He's trying to answer a question. And the problem that Arius is trying to address is the question about how God can become human. All right? That's what he's trying to address. Why is this a problem? Okay, all right. Now, that w you're, address you're answering my question. Am I out of camera? Already messing up. Um, <laughs> this is a voice coming from somewhere. Um, why is the. God, okay, you're answering my question why is Arius, what is Arius doing is wrong. It's true. Man, you guys got really nice chairs to sit in, don't you? Man, what a deal. <laughs> I bet. Where were you last week? Over in Winnegan? Or Werner? Man, I'll never be this good again. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Arius is addressing a problem. And you're right. His, his, his issue is lack of faith. But the, big, the question of how God can become a human, that, is this a legitimate question? Is this a problem? Why is this a problem? Think about what, yeah, see, we confess this stuff all the time. You just believe in it. You don't realize what a big mess this is. Yeah, in a minute. Now, what do we believe as Christians? God became a human being. Christmas, big. We can. This, we talk about it all the time. And now suddenly, someone says, "No, wait a minute. God became a human being. Are you sure about that?" Oh yeah, yeah. That's what we believe. No problem. And Arius says, yeah, "That's a problem." In fact, the world in which Arius lived said, "That's a big." problem. It's a big, big problem. Because God is, well, he's God. And he is all of our attributes. He is immutable. He is unchanging, immutable. He is eternal. He is perfect. And he has a saity. He doesn't feel so, we agree. Is that God? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Those are all. That's our list of attributes. Well, you got a problem. What's the problem? Right. Humans aren't eternal. Humans are not perfect. Well, we'll pick on that one a little bit more. But maybe they could be. Adam was for a time, so it's possible. But eternal—that's an issue. This non-feeling. That's a big issue. Humans are nothing if they're not feeling. I mean, we are full of feelings. But is it the biggest problem of all? Is this like the question where you say God can do anything, so if he can do anything, he can make a rock that's so big that he can't lift it, but if he can do anything, he can lift yeah, it? Yeah, but not quite. It's, it's, uh, it's not really on that line, but it, it might border on that. This is a more s serious issue. This is an issue of saying that we know what God is like, and he's immutable. And now you're trying to tell me that God became human. Well, right away we've got a problem. Because in the very sentence, become, what does that imply? Change. Exactly. Change. And if there's a change, it's either a change from the lesser to the better or from the better to the worse, no longer perfect. One way or the other, perfection is lost as well. And so immutability implies a change in God, and a change in God implies a lack of perfection. Which is why Aristotle, when he was thinking about God, came to the conclusion, God is the unmoved mover, who sits around all day thinking about what? God. Because there's nothing else more perfect to think of than himself. And if he thinks about anything else, then he'd be thinking about things that change, and that would change, and he can't have that. So, God is immutable. This is the world in which Arius lives. 325, early 300s, the Greek world the world of the philosophers. And they said, this is what God is. Immutable, eternal, perfect, no feelings. The Greeks and the Romans were not running around believing in Zeus and Athena and stuff. Some of them, perhaps. But most of them were 
understood God is this you know, force that's there and this power and of personhood. But to say that he became human, no way. No way. So this becomes a real stumbling block for the Christians because the Christians are running around saying, hey, God became a human being. And the philosophers are saying, no. Can't be. So then Arius is going to try to say, all right, so what do we mean when we say that God became human? How are we to understand this? What do we mean? What do we confess? So Arius was trying to put an explanation to this problem, and he was trying to be orthodox. He wanted to be that. So he said, well, let's sort this thing out. There's clearly a subordinationism in Scripture. Son clearly is less than the Father. In fact, I would go so far as to say that there is a difference between the fatherhood of God and the Son of God. There's not the same godness. And he summarized it this way. Arius said, there was a time when he was not referring to Christ. And he said that in the Bible it says that Jesus was begotten. Well, that means he came into being. So you had the Father, and then the Father brought the Son into existence a long time ago, way before the creation, but he's not original, not eternal, not God the same way the Father is. That's what Arius came up with. Small thing. He's still really powerful. He's still great. He's still God. Not quite the same as the Father. And Athanasius recognized, as we pointed out, that's a big problem because he's not any longer of the same substance or homoousius. And so Athanasius said, no way. You can't have this. And he rejected it. But see, Arius is simply trying to accommodate the teaching of the church into the culture of his time. He didn't want to be a heretic. He didn't think he was a heretic. He didn't recognize himself being a heretic. And most of the church in Arius' day agreed with Arius. The majority said, Arius has got it right. The minority went with Athanasius. And the fact that Nicaea went the way it did, most people consider it a miracle. Because the emperor did not want it to go that way. And after the council, it was Athanasius who found himself as an exile on the run, on the lamb, for most of his life, living in persecution because the Arians were carrying the day. And it wasn't until 381 when finally they really kind of put the nail in the coffin of Arius and the Nicene Creed took the day and that was the end of it. But it hung on for a long time. This is the way heresy often works. A heretic doesn't want to be a heretic. He's just trying to explain something, but easily can end up in error. So the lesson we learned is this. You need to always check what you're doing to make sure you're being faithful to the scriptural witness and that you're being in line with what the church is teaching. Because the church is important. And this is also kind of a surprise for most of us who grew up Lutheran. Because we grew up, grew up believing the Bible is all you need who cares about tradition. Which is frankly not true. Not true. We care a lot about tradition. We care a lot about what the church has taught. We pay attention to what the church has taught. What they said at Nicaea matters. What they said at Constantinople in 381 matters. What the reformers said in 1530 in Augsburg matters. We care. We pay attention to this stuff. We're not just out doing our own thing, reading the Bible, and getting our own conclusions. We have to be tuned in to what the church has taught, and that gets back to our presuppositions discussion because we need to make sure our presuppositions are in line with what has been taught and what is the faithful orthodox teaching and that we're not just out freelancing doing our own thing. Because whether you think it or not or whether you ever gave it any thought or not, we really don't want everybody sitting down reading his own Bible and coming up with his own answers his own conclusions. That leads to all kinds of problems. We don't want it. We want people to be reading scripture in the light of what the church is teaching and in the light of what the church has always taught. It matters. Now, does that mean tradition trumps scripture? No, but it means that tradition certainly shapes our reading of scripture and our presuppositions. Okay? Now, any questions or anything further then on Nicaea and Athanasius and the Creed and Council. This is really a fascinating time in history. If you get into it, it's really intriguing because the um, guy who called this council was Constantine. He was the one who put the bucks up for it, paid for it. The emperor did because he, because he had a problem in, in the, in, you know, on his hands because the Christian church was starting to divide. You got the Arians over here, and you got a group of the Orthodox over here, and there was a lot of conflict going on, and so he needed to settle it. So they 
subtle did it and I see it. Yeah. You hear a lot about um, Gnosticism and Gnostic heresy. Uh-huh. You do. We'll get there. <laughs> All right. It's on the docket for this afternoon. One of my favorite topics. Yeah. So the Council at, at Nicaea, the, the decision there at the Council of Nicaea was was that Arius was right? No. He was wrong. Nicaea decided with orthodoxy. Okay, so then what was the reason for having to do Constantinople? Well, yeah, there were a lot of reasons. These councils met usually with a full slate of things they needed to deal with. Some of the things were real theological issues. Some of them were just basic things like um, who gets ordained, who doesn't, who does the ordaining, who has the authority. They were just kind of you know, casuistry things of what was going on at the church at the time. You know, you know, do we let deacons do this or that and you know, role women, that kind of stuff. They dealt, dealt with all kinds of just things like that as well. And they had to be, those things came up often enough. But the um, problem was, Nicaea had decided, okay, it's the homoousius is what we're going to confess. And it's, we all, you get this in Confessions 1. Well, this probably this year. You know, look forward to this one. You'll talk about this in a lot more detail. It came down to the, a single Greek letter because to say I, that God, Jesus is like the Father is homoousius in Greek. And to say that Jesus is the same as the Father is homoousius. You know, it's one little Greek letter, a Yoda, subscript. And so the letter made all the difference, whether Jesus is like the Father or really the Father. Now, the problem was that the, oh, here's another Latin phrase for you. Here's a, this is another very important lesson that comes out of the whole mess in, in, in Nicaea, is lex orandi, lex credendi. Uh, lex means law, orandi is praying, and credendi is believing. The law of praying is the law of believing. Lex orandi, lex credendi. Arius was a sharp guy and um, was well liked. They say he was tall and rather handsome and rather popular with the ladies. Athanasius was rather short and un insignificant. So there was a lot of PR stuff going on here. Arius was more popular. And Arius had on his side the fact that everybody prayed in subordination, subordinationistic ways. You prayed to the Father, through the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. A clear subordination. That's why people prayed. And so because people were praying that way, the belief system was kind of going that way as well. And it seemed like Athanasius was the innovator because no one had said homoousius before. No one had said of the same substance before. That was a new thing to say that. So Arius could claim to be the conservative holding the old way. And he was holding up the subordinationism that was being taught and being prayed. And so a lot of people said, this feels right. They had hymns. Arius had, there were tons of Arian hymns, bunches of them. The people were praying and worshiping and singing Arian stuff. And that was part of the strength of it. And so it took a while to overcome all that and to turn it around. And so what the church started doing was intentionally changing a lot of its prayers and its hymns to become orthodox and intentionally realizing, no, Athanasius is right and his, the teaching of, the, of, the Nicaea, of Nicaea is right. So they had to work at it. But it took a while. You know, you can imagine. It's, the, it's still true today. The one thing you don't mess with is people's worship style. That's what you don't mess with. You can um, get, you know, change all kinds of stuff, but man, you better not change my hymnal. You know, that, yeah, that's fighting stuff. People get all worked up then. And, and it was the same then. It's always been the same. You know, you can mess around with doctrine all you want, but don't mess how I worship. Uh, what's going on here? So, hey, I worship this way. I'm staying with it. And so Arius hung on for quite a while. So I'm going to say, again, see, the lessons here are pretty important. That idea of lex orandi, lex credendi, it's really significant. This, by the way, has big implications even for some of the worship style questions that people get all worked up about. Because, you know, people say, ah, it's just the words and the words are right and who cares, it's just style. No, 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 it's not that simple. Because how you do things shapes what you believe and how you believe. And there's more to that than people realize. And time will tell and we'll bear more fruit on this. But you don't violate basic laws. And lex orandi, lex credendi is just a fundamental law. It's the way it is. And if you worship like a evangelical, you'll end up probably believing like an evangelical. But time will tell. Okay? Directly, what happened to Arius and those people who believe today end up seeing you know, <coughs> the way of Athanasius? Or no, Arius died, as an, Arius died an Arian. And a lot of the people did too. 
sometimes the only way the church really gets reformed is waiting for a few well-placed funerals. <laughs> <laughs> My first colleague in the ministry said, there's nothing wrong with this church that a few well-placed funerals couldn't solve. <laughs> he, he was right. <laughs> All right. Okay, other questions? So this is instructive. You'll spend more time on this and more time with the whole Nicaea thing and the Nicene Creed when you do Confessions 1. Um, so you'll get a chance to revisit this. But I, it's, it's just, just helpful now to kind of see how this thing holds together. And the basic heresies that we're going are the anti-Trinitarian heresies. Arianism is one of them. It's a Trinitarian heresy. It seems like it's a Christological one, but really it's Trinitarian. It's a question of what is God's nature? Is God three persons in one substance? And that was what Arius was denying. So it's a Trinitarian heresy. And even subordinationism and adoptionism become Trinitarian heresies because you're trying to identify what God is or God isn't. And you're not allowing the scriptural truth that God is three persons in one substance. All right? Okay. Oh, the other thing to recognize, and this is one of the reasons I brought this up, is Arius was just trying to be relevant. And that's all. He was just trying to be relevant. He was just trying to solve a problem. And in his zeal to be relevant and to solve a problem, he ended up in what we now call, claim as one of the gravest of heresies. Arius is you know, synonymous with arch heretic, as nasty as they get. And all he's trying to do is be relevant and solve a problem. So this is a good word of warning to all of us that as we strive to take scripture and God's truths and make them relevant, that we don't end up walking off into false teaching and wrong teaching because of our desire to just to be relevant. Okay. All right. Good. Now, the next topic up then, which is going to occupy us for the rest of the afternoon, if everything goes as I've got a plan, is going to be the issue of creation. 